It's wonderful now to be able to um, introduce the first keynote of the session, um, of the conference. And the um, first keynote is Dr. Lynn Henderson Yates. And I would like to read um, Lynn's biography out. It is really significant, and I think a book, um, she's a highly appropriate person to open this conference. Dr. Lynn Henderson Yates is an Aboriginal woman from Derby, or Derby, in the West Kimberley. In 1986, she obtained a Diploma of Teaching from the Mount Lawley College of Advanced Education. And after teaching for a number of years in her hometown of Derby, transferred to Perth and gained a Bachelor of Education and Master of Education degrees from Murdoch University. Lynn completed her PhD studies in education in 2011 with the University of Western Australia. Her research focused on the stories of Aboriginal youth in education. Working in education for the past 36 years, Lynn has been employed as an Aboriginal teaching assistant, primary school teacher, education officer, Aboriginal studies consultant, deputy principal, researcher, writer, manager and lecturer. So has crossed the gamut of all kinds of um, occupations in education. In 2006, she took up an Associate Professorship and Associate Dean position at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, on the Broome campus, in the School of Arts and Sciences. In 2008, Lynn established the Nulungu Research Institute, where she remained its director until the end of 2013. Lynn was appointed Professor and Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, Broome campus. She was the first Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person to be appointed Deputy Vice-Chancellor. During this time, Lynn was also the chair of the university's Indigenous Education Consultative Group. Lynn was recently appointed Chief Executive Officer at the Derby Aboriginal Health Service, where she continues to work for positive change in Aboriginal communities. She holds an adjunct professorship with the University of Notre Dame, Australia. Lynn's teaching, research and public publication work focuses on history, education, identity, racism, human rights and oral history and more recently, the impact of globalisation on Aboriginal Australian people. So, Lynn, we are really looking forward to your um, presentation and thanks so much for agreeing to give this opening keynote. Thank you. Morning, everyone. I looked around a little while ago and there were still lots of seats at the back, but I can see they're all filled now, so that looks fantastic. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the Noongar people, traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I'd also like to acknowledge other Aboriginal people in the audience, Torres Strait Islander people in the audience, and uh, I see Tracy, Professor Tracy Bunder in the front here, so I wanted to acknowledge Tracy as well. In my presentation this morning, rather than talking about something safe and straightforward, I've instead opted to talk about a subject that is still in its embryonic stage. It is an emerging and somewhat complex idea, although I don't think it is really, but I hope you will see the possibilities in what I'm about to describe and consider how you might be part of such an approach. I forgot to ask how you turn the PowerPoint <laughs> across. Oh, good, okay. In January this year, I was appointed CEO of the Derby Aboriginal Health Service. DARS, as it's commonly called, is an Aboriginal community control primary health service, providing for the health needs of Aboriginal people in Derby and nine remote communities in the East and West Kimberley. I must say, I never thought that I would be working in health. After working in education for so long, I thought you know, health is not an area that I would end up working in, um, but uh, in 2015, I find I am working in the health profession. So this is an um, overview of Derby. You can see that it's a, a small town, um, surrounded, not like Broome, by beaches, but surrounded by marsh. These are some of the communities that um, the Derby Aboriginal Health Service looks after. So you can see that Derby is in the red. Um, and 
You've got Pandanus Park, which is, I don't know if you can quite see it down the back, but it's just below Derby in the red. And then you've got Jomadanga below that. Then if you go further uh, north to the east, you've got Imogi in yellow, you've got Teralangi in blue, Yulumbu in blue, uh, Kupangari in green, Nalaganda in green, Dodnan in yellow. And if you go up into the east, Kimberley, right at the top, you've got Candywell Community. Now the communities in green are where our major clinics are and uh, the blue uh, communities are the more remote communities who are serviced by the bigger communities. It gets a bit complicated, I know. And uh, the yellow communities are served by the uh, communities in green. <laughs> hope you've got that. Um, 56 uh, kilometres out of Derby is Pandanus Park and then you've got 120 kilometres Along the Fitzroy Crossing Road is Jalmadanga Community. About 350 kilometres along the Gibb River Road are the Imogi and two of those associated communities in blue. Along the Gibb River Road are the Kukungari, Dondon and Nalanganda communities. And then, like I said, is the Candywell Community, which is about, as the crow flies, about 400 kilometres away in the East Kimberley. These are some of the uh, remote clinics that we have, just as an example of, um, I guess, the, the remoteness and the isolation some of these communities are in. So we have four permanent uh, remote clinics staffed by Aboriginal health workers and nurses. We have monthly flights to the Gibb River communities and Candywell, where doctors and specialists fly out to treat community members, funded solely by the income generated by DARS. The DARS Town Clinic is the main administrative and medical arm of the service, staffed by doctors, nurses, Aboriginal health workers and of course administrative personnel. Prior to, prior to commencing at DARS, I'd worked at the school and university sectors for about 37 years in a variety of teaching and management positions, as Martin um, pointed out. I did whisper to Michael that um, that shows you how old I am. <laughs> I'm currently adjunct professor here at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, where I'd worked, previously worked for eight years. Although I'm from Derby and Aboriginal, this year has been one of learning from others. Fortunately, my role is a managerial one rather than medical. For quite a few years while I was studying my PhD, in spite of me trying to correct my mother, she kept thinking that I was going to be a medical doctor and she was very, very excited about that. She had a long list of things that she wanted me to check out for her. When I explained to her that it was a doctor of philosophy, she said to me, well, what is that? I said, well, it's about words and ideas, I guess. And she looked at me quite blankly and thought, you know, well, how relevant is that? You know, what, what use is it? And I still haven't been able to answer her yet. So I think she finds it very, very boring. Moving from education to health has been a very enlightening experience. I believe I've been given a fantastic opportunity to step outside of education and be exposed to other risk factors that impact on Aboriginal people, especially young people. I feel quite concerned about the young because they are our future gener generation. I've had my time, but the young people are coming up, so we need to think more about them. It has caused me to stop and think again about what the Aboriginal young person's future might be. Will they have the skills, knowledge and understandings necessary to function in the Australia of tomorrow and in our rapidly expanding global world? During my years working in primary schools and at Aboriginal college and then in universities, I was privileged to meet and work with many Aboriginal young people who often spoke about their edu educational experiences, where while they shared stories of hardships and challenges, they also talked of the high expectations they held for themselves and their determination to succeed. Today, most people know the story of Aboriginal people's exclusion from ex education, where literally there were bands and their children attending school. So I won't revisit this in detail now. However, I would like to show the following quotes, which I know some of you may have already seen. These quotes are examples highlighting that Aboriginal people have long held a desire to succeed in education, although these were often dashed by the authorities of the past. 
Between 1915 and 1918, Mr John Kickett, a Noongar man who owned a successful farm, he in the southern part of WA, wrote letter after letter, pleading with government ministers and officials to allow his and other Aboriginal people's children to attend school. These quotes still resonate with me as examples of Aboriginal people knowing full well the importance of education in creating a better future for their children. He also wrote on behalf of fellow Noongar soldiers who were fighting in World War I and was concerned about their children receiving an education. And in one case he wrote, Mr. Kicker died in the 1920s without ever seeing his children attend school. Incidentally, his farm was also taken from him. For many decades after, exclusion took the form of an alienating cur curriculum, inappropriate teaching methods and teacher attitudes, thus still denying Aboriginal children from full participation in school. This environment did not prepare Aboriginal children for employment or the choice of work they could do apart from domestic and farm work and did not offer them the ability to live lives of their own choosing. Today's world is vastly different to the past. More than ever before, our world is increasingly a globalised one, where we hear the word globalisation almost every day. As we know well, globalisation is not a recent and contemporary movement, given trade, which is at the heart of globalisation, has always been a feature of human existence. According to the World Trade Organization, globalization gained strength after World War II. It was from this time that progressively improved technologies and decreasing costs sped up the sp spread and strength of globalization around the world. De Souza Santos claimed that whether old and new, the process of globalization are a multifaceted phenomenon with economic, social, political, cultural, religious and legal dimensions, all interlinked in a complex fashion. You, in 2008, claimed that globalisation is becoming an inevitable trend in the present world, which seems a certainty as trade and human movement between nation states increases. Each year brings with it its own technological advances and rapid change. However, the technological advances of yesteryear and the subsequent changes it brought to society was nowhere near as swift as they are today. The only other comparable era was the Industrial Revolution. In the past, people had a longer time to adjust to change, but this isn't the case today. So technology features in every aspect of our lives, including advances in education, where the use of computers and the internet makes a student's learning experience much wider, richer and more adaptable than ever before. While I will never lose my love for the feel of paper, pens and books, and perhaps that's my era, the reality is that technological advances in education will see more and more teachers using the computer to design models to explain con complex concepts, create virtual learning experiences that open up learning to students, regardless of their cultural backgrounds or academic abilities, and will also connect students across the nation or indeed the world. One excellent example of a virtual learning experience that opens up learning experiences and crosses cultural boundaries is that of the e-learning hospital developed by the Notre Dame Broom Camp School of Nursing. This virtual hospital enables remote students regardless of whether they live in a desert community or in a town, to enter a virtual hospital ward with virtual patients to gain the knowledge that they require as part of their nursing studies. 
Technology touches us in other ways on a daily basis. We hear regularly of how technology has been used to improve our health. For example, intrusive surgery in many areas of the body have been reduced to pinhole surgery, thus creating less trauma for the client and enduring, ensuring a swifter recovery. Technological advances are evident in all things creative. For example, the films, and Michael touched on one that I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, and in food preparation, in communication, science, and unf unfortunately, in war. Our knowledge of outer space continues to grow. Robots are now building many of our cars, and their role in doing chores in our homes, I'm sure, is not too far away. We see new and better mobile phones and computers and computer software which we are expected to use in our work. I was watching Gardening Australia a few weekends ago and saw gardeners using drones to fly over the uh, botanical gardens, checking out the health of tall trees from above. So there's no aspect of our lives where technology does not play a role. This means technological advances and the changes it creates in society bring with them many challenges, especially for educators who are tasked with teaching young people the practical and analytical skills and good citizenship qualities they need to participate successfully in a changing global world. The driver of globalisation is information and communication technologies, which enable transnational corporations to engage in ideas and trade and do business in any country around the globe without the need for a physical presence and direct hands-on involvement in industry. Towards the end of the 20th century, the greatest change occurred in the increasing importance of knowledge as a driver of growth in the context of the global economy, the information and communication revolution, the emergence of a worldwide labour market and global socio-political transformations. The World Bank stated that a knowledge economy rests on four pillars. I've highlighted number four because what we want, what we need, is an educated and skilled Aboriginal population. According to the World Bank again, this will require a new model of education and training, a model of lifelong learning, a lifelong learning, learning framework encompasses learning throughout the life cycle from early childhood to retirement. It includes formal, non-formal and informal education. And so rapid is the changing knowledge economy, workers require upskilling regularly, which has implications for education and training providers. So schools and other training institutions thus need to prepare workers for lifelong learning. Educational systems can no longer emphasise task-specific skills, but must focus instead on developing learners' decision-making and problem-solving skills, and teaching them to learn on their own and with others. There is no question that the world will continue to change as technology and communication methods improve, and whether or not we agree with or protest against globalisation. So I ask myself, where do Aboriginal people, people feature in my quickly painted picture of globalisation and technology? Where do we actually fit? Are we ready? How important is it to talk about preparation? Article 21 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People states that that Indigenous peoples have the right, without discrimination, to the improvement of their economic and social conditions, including Italia, in the areas of education, employment, vocational training and retraining, housing, sanitation, health and social security. For Aboriginal people to improve their economic and social conditions, it is imperative that governments, education health providers and Aboriginal people ourselves don't become complacent or underestimate the urgency that exists around preparation of Aboriginal people for a changing te technological and global world. Failing to prepare Aboriginal people for this increasing globalised world will mean Aboriginal people's disadvantaged circumstances will increase 
and closing the gap will be a much more difficult task than it is now. Barbara wrote, globalisation, I want to suggest, must always begin at home. A just measure of global progress requires that we first evaluate how globalising nations deal with the difference within. The problems of diversity and redistribution at the local level and the rights and representation of minorities in the regional domain. Aboriginal young people already experience the global world without necessarily participating in it fully. They see it, but are not always part of it. There are certain technologies from the global world that they do use constantly, such as mobile phones, which are extremely popular. And by the way, this is a really good example of the coming together of traditional family and social cultural practices with modern technology. There have also been success, success stories in the preparation of Aboriginal young people for a global world. For example, each year there are increasing numbers of Aboriginal people graduating as teachers, nurses, doctors, Aboriginal health workers and so on. According to the More Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Teachers Initiative, there are now 3,700 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander teachers teaching across all sectors in Australia. This year, the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association stated that around 27 Indigenous medical students would graduate from medical schools nationally. Workforce Australia, work, sorry, Health Workforce Australia claim that there are 1,256 Aboriginal health workers across Australia, an increase of 584 Aboriginal health workers between 1996 and 2011. On the other hand, unemployment remains high. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, proportionally fewer Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were participating in the labour force, with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander labour force participation rate 20.5 percent points lower than the non-Indigenous rate. In addition, there have been some, while there have been some improvements School completion rates for year nine and below remains an issue. Overall, Aboriginal people remaining at school completing year 12 is still significantly lower than for non-Aboriginal people. However, the preparation of Aboriginal people for a more globalised world does not rest with educators alone. We are all responsible for how well our young people are prepared. Since commencing at DARS, we have learnt about a whole range of health issues for Aboriginal people, which, I might add, are often at a point when intervention takes place in the later stages and therefore much more difficult to treat. My concern is that for many Aboriginal people, living a fulfilling and rewarding life in Australia continues to elude many, especially those living in more remote areas. Each day I look out of my office window and watch young people walking in and out of Dars. And as I come from Derby, I know a majority of them are unemployed. They're not at school. They become parents at a very young age. Often have days each fortnight where there is no money where food is limited and accommodation issues exist. And I often wonder how well we really are preparing Aboriginal young people for the future, where they can participate in a global technological world and be able to improve their economic and social conditions as the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples states. In spite of the best intentions of governments and education providers, Large numbers of Aboriginal people are not put, participating fully in school, are leaving early or not exist, exiting, exiting, I should say, with a necessary education. Thank you. That is, not just being literate, but also being able to think and problematise, to help them enter the workforce and live a quality and productive life. In addition, health issues are beginning to present themselves in the Aboriginal population 
at a much earlier age than in previous decades. According to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, chronic diseases such as heart diseases, diabetes, liver diseases, respiratory diseases, strokes and cancers are the major contributors to the mortality gap between Indigenous and, non and other Australians. Chronic diseases are rarely cured and do not resolve spontaneously. They persist over time and can become immediately life-threatening. About 80% of the mortality gap for Indigenous Australians aged 35 to 74 years is due to chronic disease. The gap is caused by high rates of chronic disease at younger ages, as well as increased death rates associated with chronic disease. This is never clearer than when we look at the DARS campus. In the clinic, we provide primary health care and treat those with chronic disease. Next door to our clinic is the Derby Dialysis Unit, which has 11 dialysis chairs, all taken by 36 clients with chronic renal disease. This will increase to 40 clients next year. This dialysis unit is for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people, and yet all the clients are Aboriginal. Not one client is non-Aboriginal. One chair is occupied by a young 23-year-old client. So again, um, we're finding that younger people are now um, demonstrating chronic disease, and in particular, uh, diabetes and end-stage diabetes. In 2016, Derby is acquiring a 20-bed hostel to accommodate the growing number of Aboriginal people with chronic renal disease, disease which require on, ongoing dialysis for the rest of their lives. 20-bed hostels are also being built in Fitzroy Crossing and Kununurra. At present, there are 102 Kimberley people receiving dialysis in four renal centres in Derby, Broome, Fitzroy Crossing and Kununurra. There are an extra 104 people in the Kimberley who will need some form of treatment within the next 12 to 18 months. There are approximately 1,500 Aboriginal people in the Kimberley who have early stage kidney disease. Across the road on the other side of the DARS campus, we have our Social, Emotional and Wellbeing Unit, which provides programs and support system for, systems for adults, families and young people who require help to deal with a whole range of social, emotional and mental health issues. The majority of people who access this service are all of a younger age, that is from school age to about 40 years. While we attempt to educate our clients about their health, they primarily come to receive medical intervention, which means we principally treat conditions after they have occurred. If we are to create change in education and health, and the stories that I've touched on above, we need to put more effort and resources into prevention and collaboration. As a CEO of a relatively large organisation for the region, and also someone with a long background in education, I plan to bring together ideas and collaborative partnerships to provide opportunities for Aboriginal people to improve their health through education. Commencing in 2016, we will build what we call a wellness model based around the role of prevention. I envisage this wellness model as a wraparound model where education, health and community organisations wrap their arms around the young person or client. The idea of working with a wellness model is a fairly new one for DARS and while we are at the very early stages with lots of questions to be answered, we are passionate about wanting to make a difference and believe that this will produce more long-term results than continually continuing solely with a bugs and drugs approach, which is currently the case in health. A wellness model necessitates adopting a multi-pronged approach, and in such an approach, education plays a critical role. So how will we do it? As an example of an early wellness program we have at DARS, I'd like to tell you about two programs developed by a social and emotional wellbeing unit. The first is the SHINE program. SHINE is all about helping young people 
to develop an understanding of their own personal wealth, worth, strength and purpose and to realise the potential within to help them fulfil their desires. Some of the topics they deliver to the students include communication, positive community engagement, healthy relationships, career development, resilience, goal setting, drug and alcohol abuse, suicide prevention, education, sport and recreation. Shine is designed for 12 to 17 year old Aboriginal young women who have been who have less than 20% attendance at our local high school. When their lack of attendance reaches this point, the school calls the Shine youth worker, who then makes contact with the student and engages them in the Shine program. Student attendance in Shine is counted as attendance in school. Each day the youth worker takes a roll call and sends her attendance list to the school for their records. The program has partnered with another Aboriginal organisation who provides a school liaison officer and a vehicle to take the schools to and from their homes and on excursions, for example, to do their shopping as part of a nutrition program. Most of these girls have never tasted many of the foods we take for granted and have limited knowledge about healthy eating. Shine has been very successful in improving the attendance and partic participation rates of the students to the point where they're actually going back to school for at least three days per week. Often they begin their school week by first making contact with the youth worker at eight o'clock on a Monday morning, even though Shine doesn't begin until nine o'clock. They do this to let the youth worker know they are ready and to make sure that they are picked up. The other program we have is called The Body Shop, which focuses on 12 to 19 year old Aboriginal male and female young people who require various levels of medical treatment. These young people are either referred to DARS by the school or most importantly by their friends and peer groups, such as the high regard and trust the young people hold for the Shine and Body Shop programs. A young male and female DARS doctor works with a youth worker to treat and follow up the young people who access the program. It is often through treating perhaps minor health concerns such as a cut foot, that the doctors and youth worker can begin their education programs about protecting their health through good choices and practices. The young people who attend Shine and the Body Shop come from very impoverished backgrounds. They are vulnerable and are a very hard to reach group. Unfortunately, the majority of adults in their lives engage in alcohol abuse drug usage, including ice, which now is a growing uh, concern I know across Australia, but also in the Kimberley. And domestic violence, where unemployment is the norm and being able to look after themselves, let alone their children, is difficult. Programs such as Shine and Body Shop demonstrate how the education and health sectors are able to work together to provide better outcomes for Aboriginal young people. The other emerging area of collaboration between organisations relates to addressing increasing incidence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders in Derby. As we know, FASD has a lifelong impact not only on the child themselves, but also on their families and on society as a whole. Children with FASD experience great difficulty participating in school and find it difficult to participate in society as adults where they are often unemployable and make poor judgments with sometimes serious outcomes. Focusing on, focusing on FASD and Derby is new. However, it's not new to Fitzroy Crossing, a small town three and a half hours drive from Derby. Fitzroy Crossing had a serious alcohol issue for a number of decades. After years of being impacted by this issue, Aboriginal women leaders made a stand against excessive consumption of alcohol. Their concerns were the result of seeing the huge impact it was having on children and young people. The number of children in Fitzroy Crossing with FASD was growing significantly each year, and these courageous women leaders knew unless alcohol consumption could be brought under control, the rise in such cases would continue unabated. After a number of years of bringing together health, research, education, community leaders, the consumption of alcohol has been greatly reduced and the people of Fitzroy Crossing are now more aware of 
the dangers of drinking alcohol during pregnancy. This year, DARS, with our local schools and other education professionals, began meeting to explore and discuss approaches to reducing the incident of FASD in children in Derby. In partnership with the local basketball association, we have sponsored the local junior Derby basketball team with the aim of promoting a healthy lifestyle, which includes promoting the value and importance of education. While it's in its very early stages, there is growing interest in addressing the issue of FASD collaboratively so that it is owned by health, education and community organisations and by the Derby community itself. We have also begun working with the uh, young men from our local high school who participate in the Derby Clontaff Aboriginal Football Academy on educating them about their health and making healthy choices. I'd like to end with a quote in the title of my talk. It came from a 17-year-old young Aboriginal man through a conversation I was having with him during my data collection phase of my PhD. When I asked him, what do you want to do in the future? He said, I want to become something. I felt as though I was run over by a semi-trailer truck coming from the north when I heard him say this. The yearning in his voice was mirrored by this very intense look in his eyes and is as clear to me today as it was back then. He didn't want to just be something, but wanted to transform into something better than from where he was at the time and better than what he'd experienced to that point in his short life. This young Aboriginal man could easily see what his life might end up being. However, he still had the ability to dream, to hope, that he could have a better future. I could tell his past experiences and knowledge about what his future could turn out to be weighed heavily on his mind. Years later, his words still have an enormous impact on me and reminds me that we need to keep working hard to create change. So what does all this mean for education and Aboriginal young people? Schools, the VET sector and universities have a vital role in preparing young people for the future. So clearly, they are across the skills, knowledge and understandings that a young person requires for a changing global world. However, when it comes to Aboriginal young people, I believe another layer is required and that relates to educators having the courage and confidence to try new ways to impart these necessary qualities and abilities to be creative and lateral thinkers about how to educate Aboriginal young people, to see the huge benefit in working collaboratively with other providers, organisations and the community itself. Educators must be able to use the analytical and problem-solving skills they teach their students and apply them themselves to find new ways to help Aboriginal young people prepare for their future in a global world. We need to think differently about how Aboriginal young people are educated and meaning education in its fullest sense. That is, not only to be literate, but to know, to reason, to think and think critically, to analyse and to be able to apply these skills in different contexts. A particular challenge is to provide for those who live in small communities and towns and remote areas where they are geographically isolated have very limited employment opportunities and live a lifestyle that does not reflect the pace or culture of a globalised world? How do we ensure that they too receive the education they need to be able to make good choices about where and how they live? Of all the young people being prepared for a global world, given current statistics around Aboriginal education, health and employment, it could be argued that Aboriginal young people have the greatest need for education. Decades of exclusion from education continues to have an impact on Aboriginal people, and unless we adopt a different approach, this story will continue. In conclusion, globalisation and its technologies enables us to learn from each other, to see ourselves as part of the big picture with the potential to help us to meet the challenges of improving our health and learning capabilities and to share our successes with others in the world. 
So, let us then wrap our education, health and community arms around Aboriginal young people and ensure that they are part of this future possibility. Thank you. So thanks Lynn, thanks Lynn for challenging us and confronting us and reminding us of the embedded nature of injustice. Thank you for um, demonstrating the interdependence of education with other fields. Thank you also for inspiring us with um, moving beyond critique to give examples of how a difference is being made. We, um, I sat there just in awe of some of the work that's, that's happening in, in the Kimberleys. So, so impressive. So thank you for your time today. And we won't, we won't do questions now. It's very difficult in a hall such as this. But I know Lynn is around all day and would be happy to talk with, with people if you've got further questions. So please join me in thanking Lynn.